it's still a massive privilege for me to be able to share the word with you this morning via our wonderful technological advances that we've made throughout COVID. Um, so why don't we pray together and we'll get into God's word. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that you have things you want to say to us and things that you want to do in our midst. We just pray now as we open your word together that you would open our hearts and minds to hear what it is you want us to do. Help us not just to be hearers of the word as well, Lord, but to be doers, to be people who take on board these things and help us to be inspired and challenged and changed by your word this morning, that we may leave this place closer to Jesus than when we walked in. In your name we ask it. Amen. Well, over these last few weeks of summer, we've been looking at the book of Psalms. And the Psalms are this amazing collection of poems and prayers and almost like journal entries that we find right in the middle of the scripture. Now, I'm not sure whether you're someone who journals. I've never really been a journaler. But when I was a kid, I used to do quite a bit of songwriting. And uh, I remember I used to have this little book, this little red book I would keep next to my, uh, my, my desk. It was Andy Parkinson's first lyrics or something like that. And I can't remember what was in there at the time. I was listening to a lot of Kiss and Bon Jovi. So it was probably a lot of rubbish. But I do remember feeling that that little book had all these little personal in you know feelings and emotions and things in there that I didn't feel maybe I could express in other ways and that's the same kind of lens which we need to see the Psalms through it's easy to read them as just historical documents or just even just as as straight up songs but we must never forget they come out of these personal experiences they're real people writing out things that have happened in their life just like you or me it could be us writing those Psalms but, uh, and as we read them together, we need to be reminded that uh, you know everything that we read, it's, it's real emotion, it's real experience that it comes out of. And that's what makes them so amazing, makes them so beautiful, makes them so inspiring. And um, I really hope that that's the lens that you look at them through this morning. So if you have your Bibles, why don't we turn to Psalm 84? We're going to read a few verses together from Psalm 84. Many of you will know this song through the um, for, 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 for the psalm through the song that was kind of around in the nineties, um, but we're going to read it again, hopefully with fresh eyes this morning. Psalm eighty four, starting at verse one. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty! My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My flesh and my heart cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and a swallow a nest for herself, where she may have a younger place near your altar. Lord Almighty, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears in Zion. Hear my prayer, Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, God of Jacob. Look on our shield, O God. Look with favour on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God and dwell in the tents of the wicked for the Lord God is a sun and shield the Lord bestows favor and honor no good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless Lord Almighty blessed is the one who trusts in you amen so a few weeks ago I was walking my dog on the local park like I do every morning about seven o'clock and uh, my dog became involved in the best game of fetch ever. I was walking down onto the field near my house, onto the park, and we were greeted by two very, very other, very giddy other dogs and a lady with a ball and all chaos just broke loose for the next 45 minutes. And the three dogs were just going absolutely bananas, chasing each other around, running after this ball, full pelt and uh, it happened a couple of days on the trot where we would see them again and again and every morning ever since then when my dog goes on that park he looks for his friends 
He looks for those people. He looks to start that game of fetch again. It's like, you know, that one walk was better than any walk he'd ever had. And he wanted to recapture that and experience it again. And, um, you know, it reminded me of this psalm. He was so excited. You know, now when I say to him in the morning, let's go for a walk, let's go and see your friends. You know, I, I, I believe something clicks in his mind. He knows what I'm talking about, right? And he, you can see him as he goes onto the park, scanning, looking, is anybody there? Is there anyone for me to play with today? And if there is someone there, when they start that game of fetch, he's just fully committed to that experience. They just go absolutely flat out chasing that ball as much as they can. And it doesn't matter who he's playing with. I mean, sometimes there's big dogs, little dogs, small dogs. He has a couple who are his, like, you know, closer friends that he's, he knows a bit better. But, but he doesn't care as long as he gets to play the game. And he comes back completely exhausted and yet he's completely fulfilled. And it just reminds me of this psalm because he's just so into his walks and he's just so into that game of fetch. And it's in a similar manner to which we read the attitude of the psalmist. Verse 1 to 2, how lovely is your dwelling place. My soul yearns, my heart and my flesh cry out. Verse 10 and 11, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. We've just come back from holiday and um, we were away at a Christian campsite in France and I'll not mention the name because, uh, you know, some of you may well know it, but um, I, I found myself sitting in the meetings and I didn't go to many meetings. To be honest, the first week I was absolutely exhausted and I just spent most of the time in the morning by the pool with a coffee, reading my books, just trying to recover from the last, you know, however long things have been crazy at work and stuff. Um, but the second week I did make more of an effort to go and I found myself sitting in the meetings thinking, you know, listening to the messages and just feeling like it was, was so middle class and sanitized and the messages were just really nice. You know, they're just nice. They didn't challenge me. They didn't really encourage me. I need to take a hard look at myself. They were just nice messages, if you know what I mean by that. And at the same time, I'm reading this book by this guy called Steve Uppall uh, called Burning Ones, which is all about, you know, developing a real hunger, fervor, passion for God. And uh, I'm listening to these nice sermons that, that don't challenge me in any way. And I, I, it made me think, you know, scripture isn't a warm, cozy banquet of sentiment. It's not meant to be like that. It's meant to challenge us, convict us, shape us into the people Jesus wants us to be. And when I think of my dog on that park, and when I think of this psalm, the thing that comes through is passion. You know, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. And I have some questions for you this morning in respect of all this. Let me ask you, how desperate are you for the presence of God? Right now, today, how passionate are you about encountering him? Did you come this morning expectant that he was going to do something at church today? Are you expecting him to speak to you in the next 20 minutes or so while we share the word together? Are you coming needing some kind of breakthrough where you're just desperate for him to show up in your life or in a situation? Can you honestly say one day in his house is better than a thousand elsewhere? Do you find church invigorating like the psalmist or do you find it exhausting? And, you know, maybe most importantly, when it comes to my relationship or our relationship with Jesus, what can we learn from dogs? And I know that's a strange concept, but that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. Like, you know, what can we learn from all of these situations. I wanna talk about this Psalm, I wanna talk about my dog, and I'm gonna bring some comparisons and things that, that, that God's laid on my heart, which I think are real lessons for us when it comes to learning and developing our passion and our fervor for the things of God. So we're gonna dig in, let's get ready. Get ready to take your notes if you're doing that kind of thing, because here we go. The first point, our time with God should be the most exciting part of our day. Our time with God should be the most important or most exciting time of our day. You know, when I say to, to Bear, my dog, when I say, you know, the word walkies, you know, straight away he's up. Whatever he's doing, if he's laid on the floor, he's up. If he's on the couch, he's down. He's ready to go. All I have to do is say that word and he knows exactly what I mean. He's, you know, invested straight away in that conversation. 
when we were going on holiday, I, I can't remember a time when I've been as desperate to get on holiday. To be honest, the last couple of years have just been crazy. And this is the first proper holiday away we've had, like many people, you know, two weeks away for, for a long time. And I was absolutely, it was completely ready for it. I was desperate to get there, but I wasn't so desperate to get back and get back to work on Wednesday. But time with God should be something we look forward to, should be something that energizes us. It should be something that excites us. In Psalm 27, the psalmist writes, my heart says of you, seek his face, your face, Lord, I will seek. Think about that. My heart says of you, seek his face, not my head, not my Bible. You know, my heart says of you, seek his face. It comes out of a place of passion, a place of desire to connect with Jesus. Maybe this morning you're hearing that and, and maybe you're thinking, well, you know what? I've let my quiet times go recently. I don't know why that is. You know, maybe your quiet times are great, but, but if you have, maybe it's because it's, it's, it, it could be a duty. Maybe you see it as maybe a bit of a chore. Maybe it's becoming kind of a case of going through the motions as opposed to seeing it as an opportunity to connect with our Father in heaven, to have him speak to us, to comfort us, to have that chance to offload to him. You know, the, the reality is that it's easy sometimes for us to end up in a situation where our stuff that we do as Christians becomes like standard practice as opposed to it being something that is special and amazing. And we need to remind ourselves that actually it's a real privilege to connect with the creator of the universe. I was thinking about this and there's a British worship leader, a guy called Tim Hughes, who's written a bunch of songs that we sing in church. And he tells a story about the wonder of McDonald's. And he talks about when he was a kid on a Friday night, his dad would say, come on kids, mum's not cooking tonight. We're gonna go to McDonald's. Now, why he couldn't cook, you know, I don't know. And obviously I'm not advocating going to McDonald's every Friday night because it's very unhealthy. However, you know, Tim says on a Friday night in his house, that's what they would do. They would go to McDonald's. He says he'd go to McDonald's, he'd get his Happy Meal, you get the little toy, you get your chicken nuggets, all of that stuff. He said back then, you know, Ronald McDonald was probably there. It was just a magical experience. And he talks about as he got older, when he was a student, and one day he says he's coming out of the um, McDonald's with his Big Mac and his supersized fries and his milkshake. He says, and it suddenly dawned on him that he'd lost the wonder of McDonald's. It wasn't as special as it was all them years ago. You know, maybe this morning you can relate to that. And, and if you've lost the wonder, then let me encourage you. You need to take the time to figure out why. You need to, to prayerfully consider why is that time with God not as special? You know, maybe it's not your fault. Maybe, you know, a change in circumstances has meant that time with God is now really pressured. And so it's not as enjoyable. Maybe you've changed jobs and you work in antisocial hours or, you know, maybe you've got, you know, young children now that take up your time in the morning. But for whatever reason, that time just isn't as special as it once was. Well, you know, maybe it's time to explore putting that right by changing your routine up a bit or introducing a bit of variety. But it's important that we get that wonder back and we live out of a place of wonder when it comes to connecting with our Father in heaven. John Piper writes, the greatest enemy of hunger for God is not poison, but apple pie. He says it's not the banquet of the wicked that dulls our appetite for heaven, but the endless nibbling at the table of the world. It's not the X-rated video but the prime time dribble of triviality we drink in every night. I don't know about you, but uh, you know, I am certainly guilty of drinking in some triviality after a long day at work and a busy you know, time of family stuff. You know, often I'm ready just to kind of veg on the couch from about half past eight at night. And um, it's something I need to guard in my life. Um, not that I shouldn't have downtime, but got to remember all of us that Jesus needs to be first and that time with him, you know, it fuels us for everything else that we, we do in our day-to-day -day lives. Now, I'm not trying to challenge anyone in a way that makes you feel bad this morning. I'm just trying to make you think, right, because we all go through times when we need to refocus. I've been going through a time recently when I'm trying to make more time again to see God's presence because I know with everything I have going on in my life, I need more of God. 
and you do too. So let me encourage you, start that new Bible plan today. Get on your favorite streaming service for some new Christian music. Block out some time in your diary. Make it a daily habit again to pursue God because you need him. We need to make time for God. It should be the most important, most exciting time of our day. The second point is that when it comes to seeking God, we should be people who are all in. Again, going back to my dog, when it comes to his walks, he is completely all in. He's completely committed to them. So when I take him for a walk, you know, some dogs you'll see them, they just kind of toot along behind their owner. My dog is not like that. He rolls in the long grass. He, he plays in the stream. He finds oversized sticks to drag around with him. You know, he, he's looking, like I say, for other dogs. He looks for stuff to chase, squirrels, birds, you know, anything. You know, he just loves to be like full pelt, running, you know, immersed in being outdoors, like being a dog. He loves it. Um, you know, one of our values as a church is we talk about being people who are all in. And by that, we, we don't mean that we're just about serving on team or showing up to meetings, but it's about putting God first because we recognize that he's the best thing for us and for others. In Psalm 34, verse 10, the psalmist writes, the lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. In other words, you know, seeking God is important because it benefits us, it's good for us. Jesus himself said in Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God and the rest will be added onto you. In the book of Revelation chapter three, we read about the spirit of God sending a message to the church at Laodicea and he's upset with them. And he talks about how he's disgusted with them because they're lukewarm, they're, they're neither hot or cold. And because of that, he says he's about to spit them out of his mouth. You know, in this church, Grace Church Sheffield, we're not about preaching lukewarm Christianity. Again, we're not about sanitized, nice messages. We wanna deliver teaching that's rich, that makes you think, that has an impact in your life and on the lives of those around you. We wanna create a company of burning hearts who are hungry for the presence of God, who are excited to come to church and see what he does and live expectantly every day out of a place of relationship with their heavenly father. Again, are you expectant this morning? Are you expecting God to do things in your life and in the lives of those around you? John Wesley, who was a famous evangelist, preacher, songwriter, used to do a lot of kind of crusades on horseback all over the country. He was once asked why so many people would come and watch him preach. And in reply to that, he just said simply, I set myself on fire and the world comes to watch me burn. Of course, he was talking about getting his, getting passionate about Jesus and that passion becomes infectious to others. In just a few days, it's our 17 year wedding anniversary. You know, when we got married, Janine and I, we were 22, we had no kids. We had significantly less financial responsibility and less constraints on our time. And it was much easier to keep our relationship alive and keep their lines of communication open. Now, as we both approach 40, it's a lot more complicated, but you know what? It's more important for us to do that than ever because you can't run a marriage on autopilot. And it's exactly the same with your relationship with Jesus. Perhaps you feel this morning that your relationship with God isn't what it once was. Maybe you feel it's better than ever. Great if that's the case. But if you're one of those who feel like the former, like it's not what it was, maybe you're thinking, well, I'm not as involved as I used to be, or I just, there's no place for me here. Let me encourage you that that's not how God feels about you. In the book of Revelation, again, in, in chapter two, when the spirit of God is writing this town to the church at Ephesus, he challenges them. He says, you've forsaken your first love. Return and do the things you used to do. What does that look like for you this morning? God's love for you today is just as passionate as he's ever been. He's all in when it comes to you. Make the choice to be the same with him. You know, an old pastor friend of mine, when we were getting married, encouraged me that uh, it was really important to keep the spark of your marriage alive well into your later years. And he talked about how with his wife, he told me he still chases around just like he did when they were first married. It's just that now 
they, she had to run a little bit slower for him. You know, God is prepared to run a bit slower for you this morning because he wants you to be passionate about him. He wants you to encounter with him. Life may have moved on. You might be older, you might be more tired, you might have more responsibility, but God is absolutely besotted with you and he wants to be have a passionate relationship with you and he wants the same from you. God deserves better than being in a one-sided relationship with us. So get back into the habit of worshiping him, invest in your relationship with him, buy some new books, sign up to a Bible study, start journaling if, if that interests you or go for prayer walks, tell him you love him and start getting busy again, serving him. There's no retirement in the kingdom of God. The last point then, as we bring this message into a close, our walk with God can be infinitely improved if we surround ourselves with others who are passionate about him too. Like I say, my dog loves a walk. He loves to go for a walk with me. But if he sees his friends, that walk is just elevated to the next level. He would rather play with other dogs than walk for hours with me on his own. He just gets so much out of that experience. And that's of course because dogs are pack animals. They're made to be connected with other dogs, to be part of a group. And that's why they make such great family pets. You know, in the same way, we were made for a relationship as human beings. One of the biggest threats to our potential as individuals is, is who we surround ourselves with. And Luke talked about that a lot in our last series, Relation Boats, about how we need to be careful who we're around and all of that type of thing. But you know, another threat to our potential is if we choose to isolate ourselves. You know, in work, we, we talk about how addiction, the opposite of addiction is connection. And that's because addiction drives you to a place of isolation. It isolates you from, from daily life because all you can think about is that thing that you need to put in your body to make you function. It isolates you from friends and family because often you're lying to people and they don't wanna be around you because of your behaviors and all of that type of thing. Sometimes if you end up in prison because of the things that you've been done, then, then it isolates you from society. But the, the truth is when we're isolated, we, we're vulnerable, you know, but if we're connected with others, it brings us out of some of those difficult situations. See, when, when we're on our own, when we're isolated, it's easy for us to be disinterested, disengaged, alone with our thoughts, our anxieties, our problems. They can all seem bigger and we're at increased risk of attack. You know, we've all seen them wildlife documentaries where you see the lion going after the lone deer or the wolf going after the lone sheep. That's because there's, there's, you know, there's strength in numbers and there's weakness when you're on your own. See, connection brings you out of that place of isolation. It gives you that strength. It gives you that support network. My youngest daughter, Beth, if you've ever been on a walk with her, then you will have found out that she talks constantly to you when you're on a walk with her or on a journey to be fair she does it in the car too just ask uh, Colleen when she went on a walk with Beth not that long ago with Trev and Pat and, you know she talked constantly the entire time she'll talk to you about school she talked to you about you know favorite subjects she'll talk to you about how she wants to be a marine biologist she'll talk to you about things she's playing at home she'll just talk to you constantly the whole way there in the car she'll talk to you constantly all the time but she'll make your journey interesting and you definitely don't feel like you're on your own when you're on a journey with Beth. Let me ask you, who are you sharing your journey with? Who's praying for you? Who are you accountable to? Who do you connect with for fun? Maybe you've been hurt by, you know, relationships in the past and because of that, you've closed yourself off. You know, maybe you needed to for a while as well because of the things that happened to you. But let me tell you, God doesn't want you to live in a place of isolation. And he's, let me encourage you this morning, it's time to reconnect with others. One of the messages I sat in when we were at holiday was about you know, COVID and how it's been a challenging time over the last two years for many, many people because of COVID. And, and to be honest, I was a bit surprised, you know, that two and a half years in, we were still talking about COVID. I think that's probably because we worked, you know, all the way through it. And for us, it was in some ways, you know, very, very challenging being in the midst of all of that stuff. But um, there was a call for prayer for people who were, you know, felt isolated or felt disconnected or felt like that thing, you know, that whole pandemic had driven them to a place where it had just been hard and difficult. And maybe you can relate to that this morning. Maybe you feel isolated. Maybe you feel disconnected. Maybe your walk with Jesus has suffered because of COVID. Well, let me encourage you. Reach out to someone today. 
Join a small group, go for prayer in the back room afterwards. Start to connect with people again. In Ecclesiastes 4, the Bible tells us a cord of three strands is not easily broken. Hebrews 10 encourages us, let's hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess. Let's consider how we can spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let's not give up meeting together. Let's encourage one another all the more as we see the day of Jesus' return approaching. So then as we close, and let me invite the musicians up. Guys, as even though I'm not there, it's, it's a good time for you to come up. <laughs> um, let me just tell you, you know, I, I want, with this message, I want you to encourage you to, that, 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 you know, coming back to where we started with the psalmist saying, better is one day in your house than a thousand elsewhere. That's the goal, right? That's the goal that I want to get to for my life. I want to be able to say that one day in the presence of God or, or a time with God is better than anything else, better than my favourite football stadium, my favourite concert, my favourite Netflix binge, my favourite restaurants, all of that. And that should be all of our goal. Ultimately, that connection with God, that time with God should be precious to us and we should eagerly pursue it and we should aim to be people who have the same passion that the psalmist had. We should be aiming to be people who are as passionate about God as my dog is about his walks. Life with God should be exciting and refreshing. Church should be a positive place for us to connect with others and with our Heavenly Father. But the truth is, maybe to get there, because I'm not there yet, and I'm sure you're not either, we have to put that work in. And that means making time for God. Because, you know, we need to, because we were made for it, because we need that time with Him, because it's good for us. And it means also getting connected with others, because they make our life more fun because they'll encourage us and support us on our journey with Jesus. And because our passion for Jesus should drive us to connect with other people and share his love with others. I want to close by reading you an excerpt from a book called Dangerous Wonder by a guy called Michael Iaconelli. And this is a bit of a callback to those nice sanitized messages I was talking about. I don't want to be a church that preaches messages like that. I don't want to be a part of a church like that. Ultimately, like I say, scripture is meant to challenge us and convict us. And we want to create this group of people who are all in. Well, this is kind of the, the antithesis of people who are all in. So let me read this to you as we consider how we might respond to this message this morning. Michael Iaconelli writes this, he says, we've lost our astonishment. The good news is no longer good news. It's okay news. Christianity is no longer life-changing. It's life-enhancing. Jesus doesn't change people into wild-eyed radicals anymore. He changed them into nice people. If Christianity is about being nice, I'm not interested. What happened to the category-smashing, life-threatening, anti-institutional gospel that spread through the first century like wildfire and was considered dangerous? What happened to the kind of Christians whose hearts were on fire, who spoke the truth no matter what the consequence, who made the world uncomfortable, who were willing to follow Jesus wherever he went? What happened to the kind of Christians who were filled with passion and gratitude and who every day were unable to get over the grace of God? I'm ready for a Christianity that ruins my life, that captures my heart, that makes me uncomfortable. I want to be filled with astonishment, which is so captivating that I'm considered wild and dangerous. Yes, I want to be dangerous to a dull and boring religion. I want a faith that's considered dangerous to a predictable and monotonous culture. I want to be able to say that better is one day with God than a thousand elsewhere. Why don't we pray together as we close now? Father, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for this time we've been able to share together. I pray for all of my friends here and those watching online as well. I pray, Lord, that we would all reflect on what we've talked about this morning. Help us to consider how passionate we are about seeking you, about making time for you, and help us to see how it's important for us to make that a top priority in our lives, to connect with you, to connect with others Lord, help us not to be people who are safe and sanitized and, you know, nice and middle class and easygoing. Help us to be a company of people who are passionate about you, who are all in, who are committed to seeking after you and expecting for the things that you're going to do in our lives and in the lives of others. I pray for everybody today who feels that they need to make that step again into a place of pursuit 
in pursuing you, at a place of um, pressing into your presence. For those who feel they've lost their way or have let other things cloud their existence, Lord, I pray that you would help them to see that you are just as passionate about them now as you've ever been. And Lord, may we leave this place on fire to you for you today to be more like you than when we walked in. Lord, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for how passionate you are about us. Help us, Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit to be people who put you first, who seek after you, and who connect with others that they may see your love for them too. In Jesus' name, amen.